Welcome, everybody. Welcome to episode number 142 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Ayalon, CEO of Greek University. We call these episodes Fraternity Foodie because there is nothing like great food to bring people together. Now, go and check out our new book. We released it three weeks ago. It's called From Letters to Leaders, Creating Impact on Your College Campus and Beyond. It's available on your Kindle for only $2.99 right now or you can have the paperback shipped to you for only $9.99 on Amazon. A great deal, either way, go check it out. Now, today we have with us a treat, especially during Sexual Assault Awareness Month. We have with us Mike Domish. He is an author, leading authority, an educator, an expert, and a certified speaking professional. He's also the founder of the Center for Respect Incorporated, which is formerly the Date Safe Project, if you're familiar with that. Mike has devoted his life to the mission of the Date Safe Project to provide parents, educators, middle schools, high schools, colleges, universities, military, and corporations the skills to create a culture of respect for reducing sexual harassment, reducing sexual assaults, and these skills that he teaches address workplace attitudes, honoring boundaries, respect, bystander intervention, teen dating, sex education, abstinence, reducing sexual assaults and rapes on college campuses, and supporting the survivors of sexual assaults. Over the last two dec decades, Mike has spoken on four continents, hundreds of institutions. His clients go from the local school district to parenting organizations all throughout the country. He's also worked on very prestigious college campuses. He's also worked with the US military, both stateside and also overseas, as well as corporations. He's got some books out there. One of them is called, Can I Kiss You? Uh, a thought provoking look at relationships, intimacy and sexual assault. And he's got another one that's called Voices of Courage, Inspire, Inspiration from Survivors of Sexual Assault. Both of these books are being utilized all across the globe. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you, Mike, for that wonderful introduction. I love your passion and energy. So thanks for opening this conversation up. Hey, it's my pleasure, and I'm available if you need me to introduce you on college campuses. <laughs> I mean, you just throw me in your suitcase and just open me up on stage. I'll do a great introduction, get the crowd all warmed up, and then we have your presentation. I love it. <laughs> all right, it sounds like a deal. Now, I want our audience to know a little bit about you. I think it's important to know where you came from, and you decided on the University of Wisconsin in Whitewater for your undergraduate experience. So I'm wondering why was the University of Wisconsin Whitewater the right choice for you? Well, it, I have to back up a little bit there because I actually started at Loyola University of Chicago. Uh -huh. I ended up at Whitewater and there is a reason for that. So I will absolutely be happy to share that story, Mike. So I was determined to become an actor. I was gonna be an actor on Broadway. That's what I wanna do with my life. So I looked at NYU, I looked at a few other schools and I landed at Loyola University of Chicago's theater department. And it was going great. I was having, I was loving it there and I was having success for a college student. I was in the shows, it was going great. And I received a phone call. One of the first days of my sophomore year back on campus, we were actually back early rehearsing for a show uh, on main stage and came back to my room. There's another door, door, door about call home. And when I called home, it was my mom informing me that I have three older sisters and the youngest of those three older sisters had been raped. Oh, no. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was lost. I was confused. I was angry. And over time, I would struggle as a student at Loyola. I went from doing really, really well to struggling academically. And I realized I need to be home. I need to be home back near my family during all of this. And I also started thinking theater is very in, unsecure career field. And this rocked me, my, my sense of family. And I thought, I want something more secure. So I transferred to the University of Wisconsin Whitewater to go into business. Uh, and what I would later end up doing is actually going into entrepreneurship, starting my speaking. And I started my speaking company at UW Whitewater. Whitewater has, still does, had then and has now an amazing business school. So that's what drove me to Whitewater. And at the time it's where I was from. So it allowed me to be home with everything going on with the case uh, involving my sister and allowed me to be at a great school studying in a program that they were known for. Wow, so that really works out well. And now I certainly understand why you're so passionate about this particular topic of sexual assault prevention and awareness. It's really, it all goes back to the story with your sister, right? 
It absolutely does. Yeah, when I saw her strength and her courage as a survivor, mm -hmm. I was one, inspired, and two, realized when I heard that speaker, I want to do something about this. So that's what changed everything. When I was at Whitewater, I heard a speaker and I realized, wait, I can use my words to do something about this. So Sherry's inspiration, right? Her strength, her courage, led by then hearing a speaker and realizing I could do something about this. I started speaking out right then. I started speaking in schools when I was 20, 21. Wow, that is uh, absolutely an incredible story. I wish that I would have started speaking uh, that early in my life. It wasn't until later in life when I was actually cutting checks as the executive director of the organization to other speakers to come and speak to our college students. And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, you mean that we can get paid and make a full-time living working with college students and empowering them to make their campuses safer? Where do I sign up for that? <laughs> yeah, well, and when I started doing this, everybody said the opposite to me. They yeah. said, you know, that topic, what you're doing, you better keep a side job. You better just do this on the side. Well, I don't do anything on the side. Like if I'm gonna do it, I'm all in. And I knew this is where I wanted to be. So when I came back to this full time in 2002, I did it here or there for a long time. But when I came back to it full time in 2002, it really took off. The, the college market had changed. When I was originally doing this 91, like I said, 91 to 94, schools weren't talking about this. And they, they weren't even having doctorates talk about it. I was 24 and I looked like I was 17. That didn't help. It really didn't help. So I was running at all these walls and in 2002 people were like, no, we're looking for these conversations. And it just, when we put it out there, we started showing up at conferences and people were like, we want that approach. We want that energy. We want our students that engaged. And it, we were very fortunate. Those conferences allowed us to just flourish and the word got out and we went to full time in, a, in a, within a year, we were packed on campuses. And now it's hard to believe that's been 19 years of, of doing this and absolutely loving it. Good for you. And, and thank you for kind of uh, showing us the way and, and building that path. I mean, I started talking about sexual assault prevention in 2012. Certainly it was before the Me Too movement. And, you know, even then people were like, you know, you're talking about this, you know, why are we talking about this? And I'm like, what do you mean? I mean, I'm like, look at the statistics. I'm, you know, as somebody who is a fraternity man that took a commitment to those values about, you know, protecting our members and our guests and, and all of those things and, and respecting other people, I'm like, how could I not get involved in this? And, and so, uh, but thank you. I mean, obviously it's oh, important right. to have other men like you talking about this. Well, I appreciate that, Mike. You know, one of the battles with this is, and you've probably seen this too, people try to keep things internal. Mm -hmm. And so they try to deal with everything from within. Campuses would do it at times. Greek life would do it at times. We're only going to bring speakers who are Greek life speakers. Well, then what if somebody out there is amazing and you're not bringing them because they're not, they don't have a past Greek life? The question is, can they relate to the Greek life student? Are they telling their story only? Or are they bringing the student stories into the experience? If that's what you do, any audience you walk into, you can relate to because it isn't about you. It's right. about the audience. But sometimes people close out. They keep these boundaries of we're only going to work with this kind of, and they lose out on seeing ideas and ways that they, they've never seen because that's outside the walls, outside the boundaries. Mm. Yeah, I also, I want to, I was thinking about kind of the high school, you know, what happens before they get to the college campus. I have a couple of kids in high school. I have a daughter, she's a freshman in high school. I have a son who's a sophomore in high school. And I'm wondering, are today's high school students getting the skills that are needed to engage the students and teens of all genders? Is it realistic? Is it honest? When we talk about sex education, are we talking about abstinence? Are we talking about oral sex? Are we talking about pregnancy? I mean, are these topics being covered in the high schools? Nope. And when I say nope, it doesn't mean not anywhere. It means that it's rarely being done well. Mm -hmm. So it's glossed over uh, for the most part, or it's just not discussed at all. If it is discussed, it's a not to program. It's not a, what do I do when I'm in these situations? How do I make good choices for myself and my partner? It's not a proactive discussion. It's a don't get in trouble, don't rape, don't get pregnant, don't get STDs, don't get STIs. It's a don't world, which nobody wants to be told. I don't care whether you're 16 or 55, you don't want to kind of be told what not to do, right? You want, what can I do? And what's amazing is the schools that we do work with middle schools and high schools in addition to universities. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing is when you go into the schools, the students are like, oh my gosh, thank you. 
Thank you for finally letting us have this conversation in an honest fashion, right? That's realistic to what we experience. And what's really incredible, Mike, is the administrators and the teachers who are like, wow, that wasn't what I thought. They have in their mind that if you talk about this, kids are gonna have this new excitement to experiment sexually like they never have before. Like you're gonna create ideas they haven't already had. When in reality, when you do this right, they recognize, wow, the experiences I'm having don't meet the standards of excellence we're discussing in this program. Mm -hmm. And I deserve to be at a standards of excellence when it comes to my intimacy, to my relationships, to my body. And now I can recognize I'm not getting that or my partner's not getting that. So I want to slow down. The irony is the more we give education, the more students actually want to slow down to raise their standards, to raise the bar of expectations, which is a super healthy discovery. Yeah, I'm saying the same thing, you know, as I'm working with college students, um, but right before the pandemic hit, I was talking about sexual assault prevention on a college campus in Michigan. And literally, I mean, the women and the men stood up, they started clapping in the middle of the presentation because I was literally explaining to the college students what yes sounds like on a college campus and what no sounds like on a college campus. And it was met with like applause because this was an open and honest dialogue about what we should have been talking about from day one so that way everybody understands what that sounds like because sometimes it's not always a yes y-e-s but sometimes it's not always a no and no it sounds different and so we have to work on that and 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 basically have those discussions so that way when you hear certain things like i'm not comfortable with that um that we know that that's another way of saying no right yeah and to teach that it's that the only response to that is okay thanks for sharing thanks for letting me know it's not why not right it's not well we'll get over that <laughs> well no no this isn't a barrier for you to triumph that's not the idea here there's someone's body and their boundary you honor it and yeah. that's the other part that very few people teach how do you honor the answer of your partner right most people try to change the answer of the partner if it's not on their own plan in other words if i think we're doing this and suddenly you say no well i got to figure out a way to get you to say yes yeah. And everything you see in TV and the movies, music is about overcoming. You know, don't don't give in to a no, which yeah. is really a pathetic concept. Versus, let's honor the no. Let's yeah, honor that's the problem. Yes. Let's honor the yes. Like, right. let me be able to say yes without guilt. Because right. there's that part of this discussion that's important. There are people who say, well, I'm not comfortable saying yes because then I feel guilty for the shame society has around myself having sex. Women in our culture experience that much more often this shame of if I say yes right. versus no, say yes with enthusiasm. Like you want to own that choice and giving people the skills to do that. Yeah, I think you're right. We have some challenges with pop culture as I look at music videos and movies um, and, you know, and, and we websites. always have, this isn't today's pop culture. No, it's always it's been like world. that. I right, mean, it's right. been like that for a long time. I, you know, I agree. But, you know, and the other thing is, I mean, we just have to check in with our partner on a regular basis because things can change. You know, I might go into this saying, that I'm a yes, and then I realize I'm with my partner and this person hasn't taken a shower in a couple of weeks. So suddenly I went from <laughs> yes to a no, right? I mean, so we have to check in on a regular yeah. basis here. Yeah, well, that's why consent's all about in the moment. Yeah, And that's phrase that people don't use a lot, but it's critically important. Consent is in the moment and moments change by the second. And people go, well, you can't change your mind. You can't reverse your decision. And this is really key, Mike, for people to understand. If at 11, I said yes, and at 11.05, I said no, that does not reverse the last five minutes. I gave you a yes for the last five minutes. Right. It now gives me a new choice for the next five minutes That's and I, in the next hour, in the next 30 seconds, I am a no. So for the rest of this night, this is a no. Right. I have that choice. We live in America. We pride ourselves on freedom. But so many people like to say, well, you can't change your mind. Yeah, I can. That's Absolutely. why we live in America. We can change our mind. It's we my can. body. And just because I gave you a yes last weekend at a party does not mean that I'm giving you a yes this weekend at a party. Yeah, even if I gave you a yes an hour ago, yeah, even right. if I told you tonight at 11 at 1045, right. that's not consent until 11 when I say yes. Right, absolutely. Now talk to us a little bit more about Voices of Courage and opening a door where survivors and victims of sexual assault and rape are properly supported by family and friends. Tell us more about that. Yeah, Voices of Courage is a book of 12 survivors sharing their stories, taking you from before the rape to during the rape to after the rape. 
My sister's one of the 12 survivors in this book. Mm -hmm. 10 identifies women, two identifies men. We wrote the book and brought the book out in 2005 and the survivors from all over the country. So this wasn't like a hand select group. In fact, I only had met two of the survivors in the book, one being my sister before the book was ever published. Wow. So it was really a wide diversity of the stories. And we wanted survivors to be able to read real stories of, of being able to move forward. This is so important. And understanding their own strength and their own courage by hearing it in the voices of other survivors. So that's voices of courage. Now, when we talk about how you create that safe space for survivors to come forward, that's specific language. Teaching people how to look some of the eyes and say, if anybody ever has or ever does sexually assault you, I am here for you always. That language is critical. People nowadays just like to say, just so you know, if anything ever happens, I'm here for you. Well, it's said so generally that I don't know that you really are when it comes to the tough, sensitive topics. Mm -hmm. You have to be specific. You have to say with regards to sexual assault, if anybody ever has or ever does, I am here for you because that's specific. And it lets people know you understand the topic versus just life as a whole. Right. That's really good. Now, the other thing that I find very often is the terminology. There's confusion out there when we talk about rape and we talk about sexual assault. Those are two different things and we have to explain that. There's also a misunderstanding, I think, on the words consent, rape, date rape, stranger rape, acquaintance rape. How can all of these misunderstandings actually cause harm? Yeah, a couple of ways. One, that when we use the word rape and then we use the word acquaintance rape or acquaintance sexual assault, when you use it, people start to grade them subconsciously. Mm -hmm. And they think, here's the worst case one, here's the less worst case one. And they start to treat survivors differently based on which one occurred to them, which is horrific to do, All right? And so let me give you an example. Somebody says, Jesse was raped. Right. And as soon as they hear raped, they picture a horrible situation. Right. They go, somebody else says, Oh, over there, Aaron experienced date rape. And people go, Oh, that's bad, but not as bad as what happened to Jesse. Mm -hmm. And that's where the harm's been done now. Because now we're actually, and they might start to go, Well, what happened on that date rape? And they might start to more quickly victim blame because that's someone you knew you chose to go there. Now, don't get me wrong, they'll victim blame in both cases. Let me be very, very clear. Society does that, but they're more quickly to judge. So here's what I tell people all the time. Just ask of a sexual assault, you know, don't, don't even ask. When you're talking about these words or these terminology, just use the phrase sexual assault. Rape is a form of sexual assault. So if you use the term sexual assault, and we all did that all the time, we would have one general statement and I shouldn't need to know what degree that's, that shouldn't matter for me to understand something horrible happened. It doesn't matter whether it's first degree, second degree, third degree, or fourth degree. Sexual assault occurred. That's all I need to know. I like it. I, I definitely like that. That's the language that I use. So I, I completely agree with that. Um, you also do sexual assault training for the U.S. military, the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, the Coast Guard. So Explain to our audience, how is this training that you're doing for the U.S. military different from the training that you offer in schools or universities? So the big break difference in training is middle schools to high schools is age appropriate, very, can be very different. Middle schools, they don't want me talking about advanced sexual situations. They want to talk about cutting the experimentation that can begin there, but they want it more around asking for a kiss, beginning dating. High schools, they can be like, hey, can you talk about advanced sexual situations? Some schools, others don't. Some high schools are like, definitely talk about oral sex. Others are like, please don't. So it really depends on the school. When we get to the university, we are talking about kissing and more advanced sexual activity, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. The one difference in university and US military is that the same audience, 50% of them are married at the same age. Oh, wow. So if I had a room of 20 to 22 year olds in the US military, half that audience might be married. In that same college audience, no one might be married. So the one element that's dramatically different with the US military is we're talking about sex and marriage for a portion of the program. And if I talked about that on a college audience, they're gonna be sitting there going, why are you talking about marriage? I'm not, I'm not there'd be no relation to that. So it, this is a key element of always knowing your audience.
Yeah, that's really, really interesting. I never really thought about that. Uh, you know, and, and you bring up a great point. I mean, it's different audiences, different needs and different situations uh, that they find themselves in. So that's really interesting. Um, and, and they live by different standards. And here's what I mean by that. The US military has core values, all the services do, and they live by those core values. If you go to most university campuses and say, what's your campus core values? Most students are going, going what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. So your, your ability to integrate that is different with US military where you blatantly can because everybody knows the core value of the service they work in. They sure. know it, all right, versus a campus. So that's why we focus on who are you? Because whether you're coming from a campus environment, a high school environment, a military, a corporate environment, who are you the individual? Who do you choose to be in these moments? Society might be, a, you might tell me, but culture's this and society's that. Who are you? Yeah. And this is I a like really critical discussion point. Yeah, I like that approach. Universities typically do have core values, whether or not the students know about it. Correct. That is a whole different you know, conversation. I That's agree what I'm you. referring to. They all yeah. have them, but students almost never know them. They don't know what they are. That's why I like working with fraternity and sorority students, because no matter what fraternity or sorority you're in, you are committing to certain values. And it just so happens that I know the core values of most of the fraternities and sororities out there. So I know what they committed to. And so I use that as leverage to say, this is why as a fraternity member, this is why as a sorority member, you took an oath when you joined that organization, the same you know, oath that I took uh, when I joined my fraternity, the same oath that I took when I got married to my wife. These are things that is not just something that I say in the moment that is you know, good for you know, today or, or a week. No, no, no. We're committing to these things for a lifetime. And I do think that fraternity and sorority members, they know the values that they are committing to, just like the military knows the values that they are committing to. And I think it, you know, it makes it a stronger case when you know what the men and women have committed to in that room, whether it be- the It military. makes it a much stronger case. And, yeah. and here's the thing, in the areas we're talking about, Mike, the violation of what we're discussing grossly violates those values of yeah. the Greek life system, sure. grossly. And what's amazing is sometimes when you say, and the one thing when I'm working with Greek life, I, I'm all about a positive result. I want positive sexuality. So I'm like, well, all right, what can we do? And people are like, oh, I love it. And I go, all right, sometimes people push back and go, well, I mean, is, should we, is that really my business, right? You get that kind of an approach sometimes. And you go, it goes back to, well, what are your core values that you believe in? Well, if that's your core value, then you would never ask me, is that my business? Right. You would never ask that of me if that's actually a core value. Yeah, that's really good. And you know, we have a lot of college students that are listening. We have new professionals that are just entering the workforce. So these are all people who are either you know, aiming to get into their careers now or currently uh, in the job market. Maybe they're doing an internship or something like that. Um, so let's talk about the workplace for a minute. What are some of the nine daily displays of disrespect that you see in the workplace. Yeah, we just, I was just in outside Boston yesterday at Natick uh, Soldier System Center is what it is, uh, working with the US military, but on a corporate, more of a corporate program, talking about the workplace setting. And mm -hmm. we were discussing these. So uh, we all participate in these, Mike. This is really key for anybody about to hear these. This is not the monster predator profile I'm about to give that people want to think about when they think about these problems. I'm gonna name things that we all do, ready? One, we all interrupt other people probably at some point or another. We might not do it often, some of us might do it often, but we have to acknowledge it. It's highly disrespectful. Think about what that says to the other person when I interrupt you. Now, I might know the next 10 seconds you're gonna say. I might, I might be right about that. I don't know the next minute. I don't know if you're gonna take it a different direction. The moment I interrupt you, I cut off your brilliance. I cut off your value of thought and that's rude and it's disrespectful. So that's a, so that's a really great one because a lot of people, we can do it, right? Mm -hmm. Degrading and dismissing a human being. And most people go, I would never degrade somebody. I would never dismiss someone in the office. All right, have you ever said to somebody, oh, we've done that before. Well, what'd you just say about their idea? It's useless. We've done that before. Your, your idea is useless. That's what we're saying to them versus Oh, you know, I'm so glad you brought that up because we have struggled with that in the past. And here's what we have not been able to overcome. Could you maybe try to think about a ways you could help us overcome that? Now they hear their idea as a potential solution. And by the way, what if they did overcome the thing nobody else has overcome? 
right? So degrade and dismiss. Now, another degrade and dismiss move is to roll the eyes. So disrespectful behaviors don't have to be verbal, right? They can also be symbol, symbolic through body language. So rolling the eyes is very, another one is denying access. So these are just three of them so far, denying access. Now people go, what do you mean denying access? All right, when you go to, let's say you're a member of a Greek organization, who's showing up at dinner when you all go out to dinner and who's not? Why are the ones who, not, who are not there consistently not there? Have you proactively invited them in? Or have you accidentally left them out? And people don't recognize often when they've left people out. So the four of us always go, and we once asked John over who sits in the corner, and we didn't ask John anymore. We've left John out. Just because John said no, even if John said no nine times, being invited matters. Being invited matters. So denying access is critically important. In the corporate workplace, the one we heard the most the last three years, and we even heard it in politics, is this one. It's men, people identify as men saying, well, I don't go to dinner, business dinners alone with a woman. Now think about what they just said. First of all, they ended it very specifically with a woman, implying you do with men. Now, when I've been in audiences of CEOs and I bring this up and people go, no, no one admit to that. Oh yeah, yeah. I had somebody raise his hand and go, that's right. And this is in a room of CEOs. And I go, all right, there's two reasons somebody does that. One of two reasons. Reason number one, you're so dangerous that if you are left alone with a woman in a business working relationship meal, bad things could happen. Now, this guy got so mad. He was like, that is not who I am. That is not what I was saying. And I said, hold on. I didn't say that was the reason. I said it was one of two, one of two. Second reason is women can be in your mind, very manipulative, controlling, are dangerous and could ruin your career. And he goes, that's it. In front of a room, he said this out loud. Wow. And you're like, okay, so by that standard, you're telling me that women are manipulative, controlling, and dangerous, and men are the most loving, caring, honest, authentic people ever in the corporate atmosphere. Now, at this point, the, all the other CEOs start laughing, right? They're like, this is ridiculous where we're headed here. And they got it, right? And he's like, yeah, but, and then he did this one. Yeah, but my wife prefers it this way too. Okay, now you're revealing that you're not trusted or something your relationship's not trusted, that is not the women's fault at your corporation or your organization. So what would have actually been the smart thing for this person to do? And this is how you solve denying access. You are consistently inclusive. And what that means is I am consistent. And that means if I don't go to dinner with women, I don't go to dinner with men either. Well, that's actually consistent then. I don't go to personal one-on-one -on -one dinners. That at least is consistent. It still says a lot about lack of trust, but it's at least consistent. Mm -hmm. But the moment you aim it at a race, at a gender, at a culture, at an identity, it's blatant discriminatory behavior that can lead to also harassment and other elements. So yeah, these are just what, we just named just three of them, right? But there's, there's nine that we can relate to in that category of the nine daily displays that we all can participate in. Denying access, we've all done it. Whether we recognize it or not, oh, I forgot to invite them over there. You know, this is that's great information. I can really see how useful that would be in a corporate setting to go over those nine displays of disrespect in the workplace. I can really see a lot of value there. Um, you know, is there anything that you uh, advise that we do in order to avoid making these types of mistakes? Yeah. Well, with each of them, we have a step. So we okay. have a, we have what's called the pause. So when you're making this choice, pause, right? That, that's true of good in life choice, right? When you're involving other people, pause. Pause and say, what could I do? So let me give you an example. In the deny, when you're denying people access, you pause and say, am I, am I including them right now or excluding, right? That immediately tells you whether you're right or wrong in the situation, right? Am I including? Let's go back to the interruption. Am I listening to learn or am I listening to respond? Am I listening for curiosity or am I listening to respond? That is really powerful. Uh, and don't get me wrong, people are high energy like me that the minds move a million miles an hour. We think we're saving time. It's ridiculous. Uh, I, have a, I have a quote that in all my speeches we put up on the screen. And it's something that I said out loud and somebody's like, you gotta put that on the screen every time. And it's efficiency is lost when pain is caused. 
Because people like to think I'm being efficient on some of these techniques. No, you're not. You're hurting the company. You're hurting the culture. You're hurting the organization. And by the way, you know, Mike, this is true of Greek life organizations. We can do this within our leadership, right? Uh, when we're sitting down and making decisions and meeting and they can exist there. So for each one, there's a counter behavior that leads us to a place of respect versus disrespect. I love that you're including that counter behavior. I think that's really where the learning happens. Yes. Um, so that's fantastic. I really love this. This has been uh, great. I can see how this applies in the corporate world. I can see how this applies within Greek life. I can see all of it. Uh, and so this has been really helpful for me, certainly. And I know for our listeners as well that are trying to understand your techniques and your approaches, I can see it all now. This has really been great. Um, so listen, we love good food here at Fraternity Foodie. And so I can't hide that. Uh, what is your favorite restaurant in Milwaukee, Wisconsin? Okay, so it's called the Taj Mahal. All right. What is it? So I became, I became a vegan. Uh, now going out a year and a half ago, full-time vegan. And so my restaurant, favorite restaurants changed. It would have been a very different answer prior to me being vegan. But this is a place where I know I can always get a dish that I really love, uh, Mediterranean-based and Mediterranean and Indian-based and just love it. It's called Taj Mahal and it's in Hales Corners, Wisconsin. I'm going to have to check it out and I'm going to have to bring my daughter with me too. She's a vegan as well, which is so unusual because my wife and I, we love eating meat. I mean, we go to these, you know, Brazilian barbecue places with meat galore and, you know, she's sitting there like, I'm not eating any of this. And so um, I need options. And you're right. I think, you know, a lot of the Indian restaurants that we have here uh, in the Nashville area, they're fantastic. And there's so many choices for vegans. I mean, I, that is the key. She wants choices and variety and it doesn't have to be dull just because you're a vegan right <laughs> that's right well and that's just it people are like oh you're vegan where can we eat i'm like i'll find something no matter where we go i will find something i'll find a way to adapt but right. it is great when we can find a restaurant where everybody's everybody's can be really enjoy the meal itself and the conversation I love it. Taj Mahal in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. You just got a plug of a lifetime. So enjoy <laughs> that. I love it. They're going to make commercials and everything. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so if our audience wants to book you to speak on their campus to Greek life, or maybe companies want to bring you in and speak in the workplace, where is the best place for them to go and to connect with you? Centerforrespect.com. Just spell it out. C E N T E R for F O R respect.com. Uh, they go there, they're going to find me, they're going to find our phone number, they're going to find a contact us. Everything is there. When you go there, you can pick middle schools, high schools, corporate or military and reach out, see the programs and contact us. We love working with all different organizations around this world. You know, the Greek life and universities is where I really, really took off. Uh, and what happened was the military came to us and said, can you do what you're doing for them for us uh, 16 years ago now? And then corporations said, hey, we've, we've heard about this. Can you do this? And we're like, it translates. And that's the thing, when you focus on the audience, and you know this, Mike, when you come in and focus on the audience's world and you're giving the audience skills, it will always translate and people will love it because it's about them. It's right. about them. It's not about, look at what I did. You can do it too. People are like, oh. nowadays people hate that. Just... <laughs> Make it about us so that it is not about us becoming like you. Make it about us and our world. Let us see ourselves in both what needs to change and in the solution. Yeah. For all the aspiring speakers out there, Mike has hit the nail on the head. It's not about you. It's about them. It's about the audience. And so I, you know, half the time, I don't even want to read my bio. I'm like, forget the bio. I'm like, it's about you. It, they, you don't care about what happened before I got here and walked out on stage. Now it's all about you. And if you yep. can do that, you'll be very successful as a speaker. So. <laughs> I agree. I agree a hundred percent. It is what it is. Listen, this has been a lot of fun, Mike. I really appreciate it. To all of our listeners, if you liked this talk with Mike, please like it. Please share it with other students on campus that want to get involved with sexual assault prevention. He's a wonderful solution out there, and I hope that more campuses will pick him up. More companies are going to pick him up and use him in the workplace. I think he's uh, been fantastic. Mike Domish. Mike, I want, I, I want to thank you. I did forget one thing. I'm sorry, Mike. I did forget. Sure. You might have people going, yeah, but where are you on social media? And I didn't oh, yeah. say that, so I apologize. I'm Mike Respects anywhere on social media. If you saw my last name, it's a nightmare to spell. So <laughs> it's just Mike Respects, because that's the core of what I believe in is teaching respect. That's how you find me on social media. So I'm sorry about that, Mike, but I realized I didn't say that. So no, I know please do. Like, hey, how do we get a hold of you? 
Yeah, we got a lot of college students that are all over Instagram and everywhere else, Twitter, et cetera. So at Mike Respects, go and check him out, follow him. Uh, that's a great place to uh, send him some direct messages and just interact with all the posts that he's got going on each day. So listen, I, I appreciate all the work that you're doing. I appreciate the time and I hope to see you on the stage out in person real soon. <laughs> That'd be awesome to run into you at the same event. You know how rare that is as speakers. So it'd be very cool for that to happen, Mike. It would be very cool. Let's find a way to make make that happen. So I thank you that. so much to our audience. We will see you on another episode of Fraternity Foodie. Bye for now.